In this lecture, we're going to go over support edge loop modeling, also known as hard surface modeling. So let's just jump into the topics and don't forget about the hyperlinks in the outliner so you can easily navigate the different parts of the video. If you need more, uh, if you forget how cylindrical support edge loops work, you can always click on the hyperlink that will be here and it'll take you to that part of the video. So before we can talk about sub-D modeling, we have to kind of learn how to go into the different sub-D modeling modes. So let's look at this cube as an example. If we press 1 on the keyboard, then we're in what we call low poly mode. If we press 2 on the keyboard, we see some interesting things happen. Our cube turns into a sphere, and we have this wireframe box around our cube. And you can notice that we can only select the vertices on our wireframe, but it affects the shape of our shaded model inside of our box. This is what we call sub-D cage mode, and it kind of gives you um, the look in between what your low poly model is doing to your subdivided sphere right there in the middle. And if we press three on the keyboard, then our cage goes away, and we can start editing the vertices right on our sphere here. That's really a cube. And you can even see what's going on here. Even though our sphere's vertex is like right here, our actual transformation handle for movement, rotation, and scale <coughs> is floating way up here. That's because when we press one, our actual vertice for our model is up there. So one, two, and three are our tools we'll be using for our hotkeys. So we can jump in and out of sub D modeling. The key topic you need to understand, the key concept you need to understand here is that when you press three on the keyboard, your low poly model still directly controls the shape and topology of our subdivided model right here. So I mentioned this earlier that sub, sub D modeling, subdivision modeling is just another name for hard surface modeling. So hard surface modeling is the concept in the industry in which uh, modelers specialize in hard geometric surfaces and hard edged models. Why don't we look at some examples of what I'm talking about? So I'm gonna bring up this gun right here. Even though the gun has some organic shapes like in the barrel and the handle, this is still primarily a hard surface model because there's still mechanical hard edge geometrical parts to our gun here. And the same concepts of sub-D um, sub modeling were used to create this gun. We can see more of a traditional mechanical prop right here. It's just a science fiction gas pump. And you can see all the hard edges. On the left is the concept art, and on the right is the actual model that was derived from the concept art. And you can see that there's just a lot of geometrical edges going on in this model right here. And here's an example of a full environment using sub-D modeling techniques. And here... And there we can see... Let me turn the volume down on this. And here we can see a fly-through of an artist sub D modeled environment. All this was done with uh, programs like Maya or Blender. I don't know exactly what tool the artist was using here. But we can see that pretty much every part of the environment is very clean and hard edged. There are some organic shapes in here, um, such as curved, curved pieces on uh, that shelf down at the bottom there. And then, you know, the lights, that curve right there. But again, even though there are some more organic shapes to this, hard surface modeling concepts were still made to create this. So it's a pretty impressive little fly through of an environment here, science fiction environment of like a science fiction lab. So this is what's possible if you really nail the concepts. And look at this little operating table right there. This is really what's possible when you can nail the concepts of sub-D hard surface modeling. So let's take a look and see what actually happens to our model whenever it's subdivided. 
all subdivision means is is that our faces are literally subdivided into four different quadrants. And this is best seen whenever we use the mesh smooth tool. If we smooth that cube once, that face we were staring at now becomes four faces. Let's look and see what happens when we smooth it again. We start to see our sphere being subdivided even to even more faces. And all these faces right here, we now have 16 faces. And every time we smooth it, it's, the faces are cut by a power of two and subdivided by a power of two. If we smooth it again, now we start to see that sphere we were seeing when we were going in between one and three modes. And all we're doing is just dividing each face and finding the average placement of the vertices for all the faces right here. And it creates uh, these more organic shapes. So I can undo this. So in the process of subdividing, we kind of lose the shape of our cube here. I mean, what if we want to keep our cube, but still have some really nice subdivided uh, topology going on? We don't want it to turn into a sphere all the time, right? Well, that's where support edge loops come into play. So in this example, I'm going to insert edge loops around this cube so we can maintain the cuboid shape, but get some nice shading around our edges. And the main reason we subdivide is all about how light falls off of our uh, model, onto our model rather. We can see right here that we have three main different values of how light is hitting our cube here, right? The front part is lighter, the top part is a little bit um, more darkened, and this right side right here is ultra dark. With sub modeling, we can make these gradients of how light falls around these edges really soft and a little bit more realistic because in the real world, hardly anything has that sharp of an edge to it. So that's why we bevel our edges using sub modeling. So why don't we just go into a quick little workflow here. And there's really, um, one, there's really one important concept to keep in mind here, and that's the closer you put your support edge loop, like if I put it really close, what we're going to get is a really sharp edge. And you can see that sharp edge right there. And we get, we're starting to get a little bit of a gradient of how the light's flowing around the surface but it's still, for all intents and purposes, really sharp, harsh division of our topology. So I'm gonna go back into regular mode and watch what happens now when I give a little bit of padding to my edge flow here. All right. Look how light is just gradually shading over our edges here. And that is the money right there. That's what we wanna see for all of our hard surface stuff, especially in video games where, yeah, when we're up close, we can really see the intricacies of how light's falling over this edge. It's really small or really subtle and it's really just nice. But in video games, since we can't control the perspective of where our player's looking all the time, some props may be seen from a distance like so. So the more padding you can get on your edges, we can still see that nice subtle uh, light bending around our corners here. Let's uh, go down to the bottom of our cube and make those sharp edges again, and then we'll zoom out and we'll see how that treats our model. So right here, we have really sharp edges. All right, they don't look too bad close up, but when we zoom away, we start losing that nice subtle flow of light. But yet, with our padded edges on this side right here, we still see that nice, subtle way light falls, folds over our edges here. And that's gonna be an important concept as well when we start getting into map baking. So you don't wanna make your edge loops too sharp. So I'll select those edges and delete them. In fact, I'm gonna go through the whole workflow here for the cube starting from scratch. So when you're starting to think about edge flow and your edge loops, you really need to take every edge here and you need to support the edges on both sides. 
So let's take this edge right here, for example. I have a support edge loop right there and a support edge loop right there. So I have support edge loops on both sides. Same thing for this vertical edge right here. I have a support edge loop on the right and a support edge loop on the left. But we'll also see that since my topology is really nice right now, our edge loops continue elsewhere on the model. So anytime you make a complete edge loop, you also have to pay attention what it's doing on other parts of your model there. But in this case, since it's a cube, it kind of cuts out some of the work over here. So now all I have to do on this corner is put one more. And we still see we have, oh, let me go into edge mode. We still have this edge being supported by that loop and that loop. And anytime you're not sure, all you got to do is press three. And we can start to see what parts of our cube are round and organic and what parts have been supported with edge loops. I'm going to go ahead and finish this guy out. And it's just making sure we have enough padding on all of our corners and that every edge is getting supported. So now we have that same cube, but from a distance, we still have that nice gradient lighting on all of our edges. And that is the crux, the very essence of sub D modeling. It's a very powerful modeling method that turns your low level, low poly models from looking really simple, complex, and uh, harsh into something that looks a little bit more professional, a little bit more realistic in the real world. I mean, if you ever look at a baby building block, they're definitely going to have these soft edges over here because why would you give a baby a sharp ass cube to play with, right? That's just one example of how these softened beveled edges play out in the real world. So you guys might have no, um, noticed I've been mentioning uh, a word called beveling. Bevel in itself is basically when you when something's kind of sharp, you give it a gradient like we were seeing when we were doing the subdivision. Um, there's actually a bevel tool inside of Maya that is pretty nice to use. So let's see how we can use it on this cube here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to select this top of my cube and I want to give it that nice gradient that we were seeing a second ago with my support edge loops. So I'll go to edit mesh and I'll bring up my bevel tool and I'm going to go to my extra options right here. And here we have a few options that tell us how we can bevel our square. So I'm going to go to edit and reset the settings and let's just use our default settings and hit apply. Wow. <laughs> what we can see here is we no longer have a cube anymore we have kind of a, a trapezoidal kind of like i don't know cube either way it's not that great but what we do notice is is that it takes these edges we have highlighted and it inserts a face in between them and it gives it that nice slant that we were kind of seeing inside of our beveled edges but as you can see we still have those harsh divisions of light on our model so let's undo that and let's see how we can use our bevel tool just a little bit better. So I'm gonna go back to edit mesh and grab my bevel tool. Width is our main determining factor on how wide our beveled faces become. So something like that, maybe that's not so bad. And with surfaces mesh display and we soften all of our edges on our cube, look what happens. We start getting that, ignore the artifacts down here, but just pay attention to those top faces. We start to see that same kind of gradient fall off here. But, you know, it's still I still see a hard division of light right here. Like right here, it's hard. Right there, it's hard. So we can either do two things with our bevel tool. We can make the width even smaller and try it out and then hit our mesh soften. And we still get the kind of a sharp edge, but we still have that hard division of light. Or we can add more segments to our faces, maybe two. And then we can hit apply. And now we start to see a more gradual fall off that we were seeing with our support edge loops. So beveling is a nice little technique where we can just go in and not worry about support edge loops and just get that nice gradient fall off. But there's, there's a dirty side to beveling as well. The second you kind of abandon a nice complete edge flow, like I just select these random edges and I want these smooth, Let's go ahead and smooth these. Uh-oh, it looks pretty good. Everything's looking pretty good. 
But look here. Our bevel tool just created an end guy. We have one edge, two edges, three edges, four edges, five edges on this face now because our bevel tool didn't have a complete edge loop to bevel around. And we get that same end gun right here. So while the bevel tool seems like a nice shortcut to avoid uh, support edge loops, it really should only be used sparingly and when you know how the bevel is going to play out because of the possibility of creating these end guns. Typically, I avoid using the beveling tool when I'm doing a subdivision model, and I typically use beveling more on low poly models. And we'll get into more how we can use beveling in the next chapter when we start learning how we can make low poly models for our games. But right now, I just wanted to introduce that beveling and support edge loops kind of achieve the same function of creating these, let me smooth this, or soften these edges, of creating these nice gradients light gradients of how they fall over the edges of our models. There's one more tool or ideology in using uh, sub-D modeling that I want to bring up, but I, I'm reluctant to share it because there are some drawbacks to it as well. But it almost seems like a magic bullet. But I'm sure if you made it this far into modeling, you're realizing that there's really no magic bullet when it comes to modeling. There's always going to be trade-offs you're going to take. So imagine we have a really complex surface. I'm just going to demo this on the square here. And it's hard to do our support edge loops because it's breaking different parts of the model or it's just can't get around the, the artifact crease that it makes. And you just need to get these edge loops creased without the support edge loops going and doing crazy things on the other side of your model. If we go to mesh tools and select with our edges selected and use the crease tool, so I got my components selected, which are my edges, and I'm going to hold the middle mouse key and drag. We start to see that I can harden my edges just by using some mathematical operations behind the scenes in Maya. Now I turn my cube into a thimble. Let's see that method used on the entire cube in sub-D mode. So I'll go to Mesh Tools, Crease. And just basically ramp up that crease. What we see is, okay, we're retaining the shape of my cube here. But I'm still getting some weird artifacting. Maybe it'll work if I soften the edges. Nope. What if I harden the edges? Nope. Still getting some weird artifacting. But it was kind of easy to make this cube retain its shape in sub-D mode, right? And you can see that our edges here... When we select our cube, our edges here are kind of thickened to show which edges have been creased and hardened just with the crease tool. So in some areas, it saved my bacon because of some complex geometry. As long as, the art, as, long as you don't get shading errors, which we're seeing on this cube here, so I'm kind of glad the cube isn't handling the crease tool as well because you're kind of seeing it's a more of a situational tool and not just a magic bullet, which I was referring to earlier. But there's also another drawback to this. What if you were working freelance and you were using Maya, but the studio you were developing for was using something like 3ds Max or Soft Image or Moto or even Blender? Well, you export this as an FBX, and guess what? It's not going to translate into the next program the company's using like 3ds Max because they have no crease tool. So all they're going to get is just this hard cube. And then you might be tempted in saying, okay, I got this, I got the creases, I'll just smooth it a few times now. And that looks pretty good. That's what that's what they wanted. So I'm gonna send I'll just send them this smoothed out version. That's also a huge no-no as well. Because basically you've just created a destructive workflow. You pass this off to somebody else, they're not gonna be able to go back in and get to the original shape of your model, such as this cube. And that's gonna that's going to tick some people off and it'll basically render your work useless in certain instances. And those certain instances come across very often. So you never really want to give somebody a final model that's been smoothed out. Basically, you've just destroyed your original shape of your model. Nobody's going to be able to go back in and edit the original shape because you've just created too much geometry. Too many verts to wrestle with now. There's no way we can go in and edit this too much. So the crease tool is there, but use it very sparingly. 
<laughs> in fact, and, let, and I wouldn't use the crease tool until you get really comfortable with using support edge loops. So here you can see one of the examples or one of the uh, models in your assignment already sub deed and smoothed out. Yes, I went ahead and smoothed it. So you guys obviously couldn't just turn in a completed model. But I wanted to give you guys an example for each of your models to see exactly how the topology was working on a correctly subdivided surface like this. You can see that anywhere where there's a densely a dense concentration of edges here is probably where I inserted my support edge loops. And it's also interesting to notice that not only are where my hard edges densely packed in with edges, but the subdivision also just goes in and creates all this extra geometry pretty much everywhere. Because remember, subdivision takes every face in your model and divides it by four and averages out where the vertices are. So you're going to get a lot of heavy geometry whenever you smooth out your high poly model like this. So you never really want to smooth out your model until you're ready to bake these high poly details straight into a low poly bake. All right, so there's some interesting parts of this model here that I'll show specific workflows and techniques on how to get around certain instances. So let's just jump into those examples on this fresh new low poly model. Okay, we're gonna focus just on some basic support loops and we're gonna look at this engine detail and see how we can do that. The engine doesn't really have too many surprises here. Let's just get in and start sub D supporting it. But we do have a little bit more of a complex shape with that detail right there. So I'm just gonna pick a side to start working on and I'm gonna try to stay on that side. And I'm constantly gonna be switching back between one and three so I can get a feel for how I'm going. So we'll do that right there. And then this detail, we're also going to need one on here. The main thing you got to make sure is that you're supporting your hard edges over the support loop on each side. So here we got that one. And then we got this one. Oh, pick the wrong model. So we're starting to see the shape get a little bit hard, more hard. But it's still not there. So let's just keep going with some insert edge loops. I'm going to come over here now. And you know what? I could probably cut this in half, right? It looks like it's mirrored anyway. So we'll just focus on this corner of this prop here. I'm still getting some boogerish, like flat inflated shapes right here. So I need to come in and even support these edge loops on either side. Pretty much every hard corner you want, you're just going to insert edge loops here. And don't get in the habit of just putting all your edge loops down. Whenever you place two or three or four, go into sub D mode and make sure that your support edge loops aren't messing up and they're looking good. And always just kind of follow where your edge loops are going, and making sure that the edge loops I inserted that came all the way down here are looking good on that part of the model as well. I'm seeing something right here that's not working out too well. So I'm going to go ahead and support that crease right there. And now we have that hard crease right there. And you can see that on this side of this ribbed pattern right here, I have the hard edge right here and I have the hard edge right there, but it flattens out and it balloons out too, too smoothly. So that's because I haven't inserted my edge loops on either side of this detail as well. So there we go. Now, if we just look at this corner, you know what? That's looking a little too ballooned. Maybe I didn't, yeah. So I think I wanna take this edge loop. I'm gonna double click it and just move it a little bit closer. Give it a little bit of a sharper edge right there. All right, that's looking good. I'm gonna finish out this engine real quick. And since it's kind of the same repeated, repeated detail, I know kind of how, where to put my edge loops. So I'm just kind of going in order here. Now when I press three, no big surprises. And I think I'm pretty much done with this engine. Now I can mirror duplicate it and have a nice beveled edge, have these nice beveled edges and light is flowing nicely on the, on the model. And it just looks a ton better. 
So here we have a cylindrical object right here, and there's two techniques that we need to learn to really wrangle the support edge loops of the silo. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in our basic edge loops right here. Put one right there and one right there. And that's looking pretty good. And I'll go down here and insert one at the bottom. So that might be called done, but remember, I always wanna have support edge loops on every hard detail here. So that poses two problems. We have the cylindrical object, but when we start trying to like insert edge loops on the outside of our bases, we start getting this. It doesn't wrap around our model or our cylindrical shape. Same thing here. It just follows this topology and that's not gonna look very good. So there's two techniques we can use to get around this to add support edge loops on both side of this edge loop on the inside of our cylinder. So let's look and see how we can do that. So I'm going to actually go into face mode and I'm gonna select the faces on the inside of my cylinder. And with all my faces selected, I'm gonna to go to extrude and then I'm gonna select my scale tool and just scale in those faces. Now I have a complete edge loop on the inside and then I'll do one on the outside. And now that inside crease right there looks sharper than ever. That technique won't work here though, because instead of going of the detail being on the inside of our cylinder, our detail expands outwards from the cylinder. So we have to be tricky here. So I'm gonna go in and start from scratch here. So I have this base here. Why don't I, hmm. Why don't I insert an edge loop right here? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the base edges, the one we should the edge we should be supporting. I'm gonna select every edge, like so. Go into wireframe mode to make sure I got them all. And then I'm gonna select my scale tool and I'm gonna turn that hard edge, uh, the hard creased edge that we should be supporting, I'm actually going to turn it into a support edge loop by scaling it out a little bit. And then I'm going to take this edge loop that I inserted beforehand. It's important that you insert this edge loop beforehand. I'm going to double click it. I'm going to hold down V as in vector for snapping to vertex. And I'm going to snap it down in line with that the edge loop, support edge loop I just transformed. And now I can turn in and do my third support edge loop. And my geometry is none the wiser. I get a nice support edge loop on the inside right here. And then <laughs> that ballooned out, scaled out edge loop. It's a little trick, right? I'm selecting the original detail, the original model, but I've turned it into a support edge loop. It's a nice little trick. So that's how we can kind of wrangle cylinders and organic shapes in this regard. The next concept we're gonna to get to is called, what I call tying off your edge loops. I'm gonna go ahead and do a mesh, mesh display and just harden those edges. There we go. So tying off support edge loops comes in handy. Say for instance, we were working on this crew quarter here. You know, let's just do our horizontal ones right here. Nothing too crazy going on. It's looking pretty good. I'm gonna do these ones right here. It's really getting there, but now I need to come over here and put these here. And now our crew quarters looks pretty good. Maybe we could put one more to support this side. Now my crew quarters is looking pretty hard edged. And I need to put one more right here. You can see, I can always tell when I need one because you'll see start seeing these weird creases right here. That just means you need to support it on both sides. So let me finish doing out the crew quarter and I'll be happy. There we go, no more creases. Uh, what happened to my silo? Well, the edge loops that we were using to support our crew quarters continued all the way around our model here. And then it went up the side of our silo and when we go into sub D mode now, we've lost the perfectly roundness of the silo here. So 
How do we do that? Do we delete the whole edge loop? Well, if we delete the edge loop, then we lose the hard poly, the hard edge surface over here on the crew quarters. Here's a technique that I call tying off your edge loop. So we go over here, and basically I just pick somewhere on a flat surface before we get to the cylindrical object. I just snap vertices together. And then I go to merge vertices, pick a low tolerance, 0 0.001, and apply. And so I just basically tied off this edge loop and terminated this edge loop into a triangle right before I got to my cylinder. So we have to come over here and do the other side because of the continued edge loop in this particular instance. And we'll tie it off there as well. So now I can go in and double click the edge loops. And you'll notice they only pertain, okay, we still have to tie off everything. All right. Basically, you'll see what I'm trying to do once I tie off all the weird spots right here. So I'm just going to snap them to. Let me turn retain component spacing off so I can start snapping two vertices to one point. Right there and right there. And then I'm just going to select all these verts and just do a merge for the low tolerance. And we're good. So now with those troublesome edge loops being tied off right before I get to my cylindrical detail, I can double click these edge loops that just exist on my uh, turbine here or a silo. And now I can delete them. Easy as pie. So now, ah, looks like we still have some weird issues going on right here. So we got to figure out what's going on with these creases. So we might have to tie them off even closer. Let's see if that fixes it. it looks like it does, but then we're gonna come across the issue of putting a support edge loop right there. And that's the missing link right there. All we had to do is just add our support edge loop at the base of our crew quarters, and it fixed that weird creasing artifacting. So that's just an example of like a chain reaction of edge loops coming in and causing trouble. And here we have, this is an interesting little area right here. We have our tied off support edge loops causing these rings creases right here, but since they're triangles, we can't exactly finish our edge loop. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start dealing with triangles. So I got these triangles that occurred and that are causing weird creasing on the edge of my silo right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna have to go in and reconstruct some of this geometry. So I'm gonna get rid of the edges that are causing this triangle to occur, and we'll just delete them. And I'm going to kind of rebuild this with a multi-cut tool. So I'm gonna take that edge and extend it to here. And I'm gonna do what I've just recently dubbed right now, a reverse tie off in which I'm reconstructing this edge loop, but instead of terminating it where it causes a triangle right here, I'm gonna terminate it where it causes a triangle right where our silo takes off. I'm gonna do the same thing here, grab there. I'm going to give our give us some support right there and then tie it off right there. Let's see what happens there. Not too bad. So with dealing with triangles, you can't be afraid to go in and delete some of the original geometry. So you can reconstruct it and get rid of some of those weird creasing artifacts. Like so. And there we go. Now I can go in and put my support edge loops around the corner of my ship. And there's no more weird creasing. So it's all about tying off your detail in the right spot. And you can even come around here and do the same thing with these triangles. So, you know, I went ahead and did the tie offs and I didn't really see the bigger picture. So it's all about being able to go back in and create, uh, correct your mistakes.
when I used to play in orchestras, I played the upright bass in some or orchestras in college level. I played with some professionals, and they and I asked them, what's the difference between me and you, you know, trying to learn what was their secret sauce. And they said, you know, professionals still make mistakes when they work. The difference is they know how to correct them so instantly that you can't even tell that a mistake was even made. And that's an example of what we're doing right here. Even though I have years and years of modeling experience, I still make mistakes. But I know techniques that help me dig myself out of my own grave. So I can just go in and spend like a minute more and just correct the geometry. And now everything is gravy. So that's the real difference between, you know, starting this stuff out and being experienced. You still can make mistakes. It's just you know how to correct them really quickly. And we have another example of a triangle like right here. In fact, you can see where my edge loop, when I was trying to edge loop around the top of my crew quarters, it got really weird. Like we've terminated into this triangle and we don't have a complete edge loop around. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And you're going to find yourselves that you may have to go in and just delete some support edge loops you've made because maybe you didn't see what it was doing to another part of your model. So don't be afraid to go in and delete some of your work. It's going to be better for it. So what we need to do is we need to turn this triangle into a quad. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and use my multi-cut tool, and I'm going to reconstruct this edge loop right here to be continuous rather than terminating into this triangle. So I'm going to just draw it up right here, come all the way, and just Boom, finalize that detail. Now I can delete this edge loop, and now I have all quads. Let's see what happens now when I insert an edge loop. Now we get a complete edge loop, like so. Boom. So anytime you're dealing with triangles on your original model, sometimes you just have to go in and reconstruct the geometry so it makes quads. Now I know that's easier said than done in some circumstances, but this is why I always warned you guys on making triangles a minimum in your original models. Because when you start adding support edge loops, it can throw a monkey wrench into what you're doing. So I've reset the model back to the state that you'll be getting it. And I'm just going to demo the complete workflow of how I would add support edge loops to this guy. So you can follow along and get a feel for some of my techniques and tricks that I could, I've showed some in the, re, in the previous uh, section of the video and the practical examples. But I'm just going to show you the complete workflow from part to part of this spaceship right here. So why don't we go ahead. Why don't we go ahead and start with the main body of my spaceship here. So I'm going to just select insert edge loops. And I'm just going to get the main body of my spaceship nice and rigid. Okay. We'll go down here. I'm going to start on this corner here because I see I already instantly have a problem with this triangle edge right there. I'm going to ignore it for right now and see if we can get away with not having to deal with it. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to be lazy. All right, so I got this going on, this detail right here. And you can see I just have a lot of triangles right here. So I'm going to have to figure out how to get my edge loops working with all these triangles. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete some of these edge loops that are causing the triangles. And then you can see I have just detail right here that it's just the way that this the space barge is made. What I'm going to do is instead of terminate the triangle right there, I want to see if I can get away with doing something like this. And it might take me a few tries to get it going right. Or I could just continue my edge loop. Why don't we see where this edge loop takes me so I can create a complete edge loop. So we'll go right here. Looks like it's going to take me straight into this freaking silo. So here is an amazing technique that I've learned to do over the years. And that's basically turning a triangle into some quads by multi-cutting straight into the center here. And then I'll do something like that. So I've created a quad here, but yet I still have this ugly end gone here. But now I can continue this edge flow like this. 
I think I'm going to kill two birds with one stone here. Now I can go here. I think I'm just creating another triangle. And we'll do something like that. So technically, we still have a triangle shape, but it's a quad. But we've gotten rid of this triangle right here. And you know what? I'm going to go in and just quad out this triangle right here. Hmm. Maybe even take my vertices. And I know I want that sharp. Whoa. All right. Maybe I'll do this one at a time. Why don't I bring these in, le in line with these? I'm kind of just creating, instead of it being like a straight triangle, trying to kind of add a nice quadded section right here. So I'm kind of rebuilding this edge right here. Younger me, when he was making this, didn't think triangles were too big of an issue. So now he's now I'm paying for it. But as you can see, I've kind of created this nice quadded out edge here. So instead of having to worry about, and I'm kind of just moving the verts so they kind of keep the same shape. So now I have a quad edge instead of a triangle. I think I still have one right there, so maybe I can. Let's just see how the edge loops will work now. Okay. Boom. I can get an edge loop around there. I can get an edge loop there and one right there. And this triangle is out of the way enough where I don't have to worry about it messing up my edge flow. So that was a lot of finagling just to get the edge of my spaceship working really nicely. Well, why don't we finish the rest of the body of my spaceship here? All right. Sometimes you can kind of lose track of where you need to put your edge loops. So you got to just kind of keep, you got to kind of go in order, like in a round. You don't want to skip around just placing your edge loops all willy nilly. I don't like the way that's working. I'm going to delete it. I'm going to get a little bit closer to that edge. There we go. Boom. That's working, looking pretty good. And I think I still have to put an edge loop on the front here. And then I think I'm missing one down the side here. Did I just create an end gun? Yep, that triangle and weird geometry is coming back to haunt me. So it looks like I need to tie off this edge loop so it's not making an end gun anymore. So where would be a good spot to tie this off? I'm not really liking the closeness of these edge loops right here. So that's just too tight. There's not enough space in this face. I'm afraid it would give an artifact. So what if I tied it off right here on that corner? Still up, oh, it's creating that crease right there. So that's not a good idea. Okay. I need to go for it back further. Right there. What if I tied it off right here, getting away from that corner there? I know what I need. I need an edge loop around the bottom here. Okay. Now my geometry is just turned into a mess, so I kind of have to just wrangle it. So I'm just tying off a lot of edge loops. I'm getting a little bit of creasing. So maybe that's not the best idea. Oh, don't want to do a target weld. I'm going to go in and reset these edge loops. I gotta think about how this edge loop is gonna come around and affect this right here. I'm gonna delete again and kind of rethink my topology. It's all just one big puzzle. All right, so let's think about what the issue is. Let's recreate the issue. I have an edge loop 
that I need to sharpen this side. But since I had the weird geometry right here, it just terminates and doesn't keep going. Why don't I do a check and see if I have any weird ingons real quick using the edit mesh, or the mesh cleanup tool. I'll select only the matching polygons and I'll select faces with four sides. More than uh, faces with more than four sides. Let me uncheck that. All right, so I don't have any ingons, so it looks like the triangles are coming back to bite me in the butt. So I'm just going to go ahead and insert this edge loop again and just fight through it. First of all, am I getting any artifact creasing this way? That's the main thing we got to worry about. And it looks like, for the most part, even though the edge loop terminates right here, it's making an end gone, isn't it? Why don't we just turn this end gone into a triangle right there? And this end gone into a triangle. Well, okay, that looks like that's already a four sided face right here. Two, three, four. So I think we're good right there. All right. So for the most part, it's looking pretty good. No no creasing. So I'm just going to kind of let this terminate into a triangle there. And then why don't I come in and just, I don't like how that's so close. So I'm just going to come in and give this support edge loop room to breathe like so. Notice I didn't use my Y axis because I would have caused some weird errors right there. And there we go. And I think we need to insert one edge loop right there to crease that corner. And again, this is really tight geometry. So I'm going to give this support edge loop room to breathe. I don't want to create these really tight faces because that will definitely lead to artifacting. And there we go. It's not the best model, but it works for us. It's not the best original model. But you know what? That's just the way it goes. All right, so that's the main body of my ship. So here's my silo. And I'm already starting to see some, some edge loops coming up and turning my silo into creases where I don't want it. So I'm going to go ahead and tie off. Or actually, I'm going to go ahead and I'll delete this edge loop for now. And I'll come back to it. So I need to I need to build my base hard surface geometry for my silo. So I'm first I'm going to go ahead and make sure I only have those top faces selected with the wireframe. I'm going to come in and extrude in. There's my support edge loop for the inside of my silo. Why don't we give it its twin support edge loop? Remember, we got to support edges on both sides. So every hard edge gets two edge loops like so. And then remember the base trick. I'm going to insert an edge loop right there. Then I kind of have to go in and I can't just double click this edge loop because it's not a continuous edge flow. We got too many poles where three edges meet the same point. So that messes up edge flow. But I will select all of the base edges by hand. And then I'm just going to scale them out slightly on the center. Then I'm going to double click the support edge loop I made. Now I'm going to turn it into the edge that will be supported by my edge loops. Now we have a sharp base here. And I'm going to, during this silo example, I'm going to go ahead and insert my edge loops that will cause creasing in my silo so we can see how to tie off these edge loops so it doesn't mess with my silo here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and just add all the support edge loops. That'll probably mess up my silo so I can tie it off. All right, so right now, my silo is starting to look like a hexagon, you know, like a bolt. And that's not good. And what we're going to do is I'm going to go in and just tie these off. I'm going to tie them off right at the crease or the hard edge of the base of my silo. And you'll see that I'm just snapping verts together. 
and then I'm going to come in. And another thing, when you're doing the tie-off method, you really need to determine which is the original edge loop and which is the support edge loop. So this right here is the support edge loop. So I, this is what I need to tie into the original. You want to kind of keep that same basic shape. And same thing, what is the edge loop? So it's on the, the right side, so I'll follow the right side. And this is the support edge loop I need to tie off. I think this is the one for here. After a while, it becomes kind of intuitive. Whenever it's two, three edges side by side, you know the center one's going to be the original edge, and the ones next to it will be the support edge loops. But whenever it's just one-sided right here, you kind of have to go back and examine your model and be like, okay, what's the original edge here? And I think if I follow here, the one on the right is the original edge, so I need to tie off the edge into the left side. All right, now I'm just, with all my edge loops snapped and tied off, I'm going to do a low tolerance merge. Now I can go in and delete. And you got to make sure you're deleting just the support edge loops. Again, the ones with double-sided support edge loops are easy. It's the ones with only one on one side that you got to pay attention to. And we'll delete them. And now I got all my edge loops tied off right at the base of my cylinder. I'm keeping my support edge loops where I need them on my crew quarters in the corner of my ship. And the silo is looking pretty good. So why don't we look at our crew quarters here. And I'm going to get into this. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is fix this triangle right here because I will definitely screw up some edge loops. So I'm going to do that just by using my multi-cut tool. And I'm just going to do what I should have done in the first place and continue this edge loop all the way up my crew quarters. Now I can delete that edge right there and that edge right there. And now I got rid of a triangle by just making a little bit of extra geometry on the top of my crew quarters. Now it's just a simple matter of getting in there and adding my support edge loops. You can see I'm constantly going back and forth. It's kind of easy to miss out on some support edge loops, the denser you get. That's why I'm constantly going back and forth between one and three to make sure I'm not missing any spots. So right there. I'll put one going down that side and one going down that side. I'll put my support edge loop going up the crew quarter right there. So it's just about getting your vertical and horizontal ones fixed up. It's a little ballooned out right here because I haven't gone and inserted this boy and that guy. And the top and the bottom of the, I guess, the deck or the bridge of the ship. And we definitely want to put one right on the front of my crew quarter. All right. So now we're going to go in and inspect my whole model because we just inserted a lot of edge loops. And looks like we saw a little bit of creasing there. So it looks like I forgot to put one right there. And it looks like my crew quarters and deck bridge looks pretty good. So all that's left to do are the containment, the, the containers for our ship goods and our little engine right here. All right, so let's let's look at let's look at our engine real quick. The engine's pretty simple. There's no like cylinders or triangles to contend with. So I'm just gonna go in and do all the ones vertically, just bloop, bloop, bloop on each side. I'm just kind of following from left to right on this boy. Pretty exciting stuff, huh? 
And I might put one there, but it looks like we're going to be mirroring that geometry anyway, so I don't think it'll be a big deal. So now we can see that, ooh, that actually looks kind of like a cool detail. So maybe you want to keep like this roundness right here, but I don't. I want it to be rigid like the original model suggested it should be. So now I'm going to go down the ones from top to bottom. Put some up here. Forgot that one right there. And it's just a simple matter of going around and supporting each little edge loop going around the other side. You can see that some edge loops kind of continue around. So we got some of our support edge loops already made for us. So we don't want to double up right there. That wouldn't make sense. Now let's do a final look. And it looks like we are done with the engine just because we followed from left to right and top to bottom. And then the edge loops that continued on to the other side we didn't double up our support edge loops. We recognized that this edge loop we made over here continued all the way here. So all we had to do was put one on the underneath. And the engine was pretty easy to do. So let's look at the storage tanks next, and I think we'll be done. They should be pretty easy unless our edge loops just go off the rails and affect something else. So it's just a simple matter of coming in and making sure every corner hard edge corner is getting supported. So with our first tank done, that's what we get. I'm going to do a little bit of looking around to make sure we're not getting any creasing for my edge loops continuing the other parts of my model. I think we just need to come in here and finish this out with the tops and the bottoms of my crew core, of my storage tanks. Do one right there. I'm worried about these edge loops right here. Yep, we're starting to get more silo. We're going to have to tie those off, aren't we? And then we even got something right here going on. So we'll have to go in and fix that detail. But for the most part, we're done with our storage tanks. We just need to fix some of this trash that our support edge loops made. I think <laughs> what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna grab all these verts that are causing this weird issue. I'm just gonna merge them to center. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty easy, isn't it? So now all I have to do is, you know what? I think by doing that, Now I need to tie off the other side of this right here. So here we go, just tying that off. And I'm gonna wrangle each one separately. I'm not gonna just tie off a bunch because it's getting a little bit more finicky. So I'm gonna tie off and, and review and then get to this boy and tie off him as well. So on that side and on that side. So now I'll just merge those tied off ones. And I'm able to delete it. Now my silo is completely round. Looks like we have one little issue right here. We never supported it right there. And I think we're done. You know, the topology is not the best in certain certain places, but we get we can get a free pass because this surface is flat. So if we have triangles or blah, blah, blah here and there, it's not going to cause too much artifacting. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and just tie these off like so right there. So we're kind of making some triangles. And I'm just going to give this triangle some room to breathe, making sure I'm not going up in the Y axis. And I think I could probably do a little bit better right here. So I'm going to follow, I'm going to basically hand mold the support edge loop right here. And then just tie it off and terminate it right there. And that got rid of that creasing under there. 
So we're at the stage where we're kind of just nitpicking some places here. And it looks like uh, looks like my storage tanks are causing some creasing right here, right here, right here. And that's because I just forgot to insert this one edge loop right there. That kind of gets rid of that creasing. Boom. So always kind of go back and finalize your hard edge, your support, hard surface support edge loop modeling. And we are good to go with this model. All right, great. So that's basically how I uh, would go through and um, support edge loop the barge spaceship. I call it the barge because it's like a, you know, it supports goods and it just looks like an industrial barge tugboat kind of thing or whatever those barges are that go through the rivers. Anyway, so the, the trickiest parts of this was kind of rebuilding this area right here and then making sure our silo stayed completely round. Look how many areas we tied off. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight different tie offs, all because our edge loops just keep continuing around our model because of our continuous edge flow. So, continuous edge flow is brilliant, but it also causes us issues in which we have to consider. So, it's just a little bit of problem solving and it's just a nice little exercise and puzzle, if you ask me. Oh, forgot to put an edge loop right there. So, yeah, I knew I was killing time for a reason. I knew I wasn't quite done. All right, guys, so I hope you enjoy this assignment. Um, modeling's getting a little bit tougher, so uh, don't get discouraged. You just need to put the time in, ask questions, get in, get in the trenches with your buddies, and help each other figure out these issues, and you guys will get it in no time. All right, thanks, guys.